Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank the witnesses for your participation today. Commissioner Jackson, the use of the practice of stock buybacks skyrocketed after the enactment of President Trump's Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. The tax bill provided significant tax benefits to large corporations, such as a lower corporate tax rate and an incentive to repatriate offshore cash, and according to one study, led to a 64% increase in stock repurchases while real wages for workers remain flat. Indeed, analysts estimate that in 2018, corporations used nearly 60% of their corporate tax cut to repurchase stock. In other words, at a time when wages uh, for average workers have failed to keep up with inflation, corporations have used the corporate tax break to collectively pay $1 trillion to executive boards of directors and large shareholders, seemingly at the expense of small investors. Instead, firms could dedicate this capital to worker wages, training, hiring, and other investments necessary for innovation and growth. Uh, what is your view of stock buybacks, and should they be curtailed when used in a, in a way that contravenes public policy? You, you lay out an analogy uh, by those smaller investors. Uh, interesting. Um, Commissioner Clayton, um, many pension funds, including some in the state of Missouri, invest in private equity. Uh, can the taxpayers and retired workers in my state uh, be assured that there is adequate oversight of private equity by the SEC? So, um can uh, retirees and taxpayers be confident that those investments are protected and that there will be a dollar-for-dollar a, a dollar, um, a retirement uh, for people that depend on those retirements? Well, I, I thank you both for your responses, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and the ranking member for uh, conducting this hearing and the witnesses for being here. Uh, let me start with uh, the GAO uh, recommended in May of 2016 that the FBI make changes to ensure transparency of its use of facial recognition technology. In April 2019, GAO released a letter to the Department of Justice highlighting these recommendations, recommending, and I quote, DOJ determine why, number one, privacy impact assessments, and two, a system of records notice were not published as required and implement corrective actions, end of quote. DOJ did not agree with either of these recommendations, and the FBI still has not fully implemented the two open recommendations offered by GAO. Dr. Goodwin, can you explain the importance of transparency when it comes to the FBI's use of facial recognition technology? And to this date, those documents and have not been made that uh, is correct. public. So, Ms. Del Greco, can you explain why the FBI disagrees with these transparency-focused recommendations? Okay, so what, what steps do you take to protect privacy when conducting face recognition searches? And to what extent do you share the steps you take with the public? I said, would you get back to us with a response? Yes, sir. You know, I'm concerned that the FBI is not fully complying with its notice obligations when it comes to the use of facial recognition. Uh, Ms. Del Greco, when the FBI arrests an individual based on a lead generated by face recognition, does it notify a defendant of that fact? It, so how many times has the FBI provided notice to criminal defendants that face recognition was used in their case? Oh, what about when it gets to trial? Do they get 
I guess through discovery they get that. So does the FBI provide uh, other candidate matches to the defendant as part of Brady evidence or discovery? Okay, well, what, what steps are the FBI taking to ensure that its use of the technology is as transparent as possible by, by ensuring proper notification? So how does the public know whether their face image might be subject to searches you conduct? I see. All right, my time has expired. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for holding this hearing and thank the panelists for your participation today. Let me start with Ms. Powell. Uh, I recently hosted a panel on the racial wealth gap. Uh, one of the panelists held the belief that we cannot discuss closing the wealth gap without acknowledging that middle and upper class black families have lost and are still losing wealth due to the segregation and denied benefits of African Americans. What do you think about that and what are some solutions to amend these actions? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Muhammad, how do we close the racial wealth gap? What in your opinion? One of the topics of discussion among the panelists uh, and audience, uh, and, and I'm curious to understand your view was of reparations and its role in closing the wealth gap. Do, do you have a view on reparations? Thank you for that response. Dr. Cook, let me ask, uh, what, what kind of solutions would you offer for closing the racial wealth gap? And does reparations, is that included in any of those equations? And would closing the home ownership gap help families build equity and build uh, investment because they were steered? I'm, I'm through. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Mr. Chairman. Let me um, start by saying that um, since uh, April of this year, I, I represent uh, St. Louis, Missouri, uh, and we are quickly becoming known as the murder capital of America. And since April, uh, more than a dozen teenagers and children between the ages of two and 17 have been killed by gun violence. Um, so let me start uh, with, with the colonel. Um, I, I heard you mention that it made sense uh, for H.R. 8 to pass through the Senate and get to the president's desk, uh, as well as the, the Charlotte. Um, let, me, let, let me ask you, uh, would it be helpful if local governments uh, could determine their own firearms regulations um, uh, and, and instead of being dictated to by the state, their, their respective states. Right now, 43 states limit local government from passing more stringent firearms regulations than, uh, than what is allowed by the state. Let me, can I hear your opinion on that? Do you think local government would be a, a good place to start? On the, uh, on, on the issue of open carry, and I'm not sure what Virginia's laws are, and, but, I mean, do you ever get reports of um, citizens calling in and saying, hey, I, I saw somebody uh, strapped with a, uh, an assault rifle, uh, carrying it open, or someone was carrying it a, a sidearm? Open. Do you ever get that? And, and and don't you don't the callers find that alarming? I can imagine, Mr. Chairman, my Thank time you. is up. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Costa. You're recognized for four minutes. 